<laughs> yeah, it'd be happy. Lord, welcome to all. Here again. We're here uh, in what I feel to be a very noble cause. That's, of course, the uh, residential library and also the vehicle by which we'll continue to have public discussion and seminar in the public affairs section. Uh, we've been working at this for the last several months, and uh, it's been a real pleasure for me, I must say, reuniting with a lot of the people who have been friends of mine for a long while, meeting many new ones, and recognizing that uh, in a few short months, we're going to be successful, and we're going to raise probably as much money as has ever been previously raised in connection with any presidential library. I've uh, associated very closely with Mary Jane Wick in this venture. Believe me, I've never known of a venture in which Mary Jane has participated. She's been nothing less than a supreme winner, so that's been a real pleasure, Mary Jane. And of course, the cause couldn't be better. We're going through a historic period, and we all know that. Although some of us who live in this town, with the kaleidoscopic situation we had here, we're today's uh, crisis is history tomorrow. Sometimes I wonder if we have, we fully appreciate the vintage of the Reagan administration. And I think that the safeguard, the best safeguard of that, of course, is going to be through the library and through the public affairs section so that this historic period can be truly evaluated. I think in all probability, even the objective historian will say that this has been a tremendously, tremendously innovative, creative, and productive period in American history. So I'm happy now to introduce to you the man who's fully accountable for all this, our friend Bob Ray. saying anything else, I want to you know how lucky I feel. It's not often these days that I get to have lunch with so many good friends. And I'm especially lonely today because Nancy's having lunch in England. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever the subject of presidential libraries come up, it puts me in mind of Thomas Jefferson. You may know that Jefferson, on his own, amassed one of the great private libraries of the United States library that included thousands of letters and personal records. And today that collection provides historians with invaluable material and laymen with a way of getting in touch with the American past. Some of my own favorite readings is the correspondence that Jefferson carried on with John Adams in their later years after they had been estranged and then found each other by way of his correspondence. And I think you'll agree that the point here is important that good historical library like the Jefferson Collection brings the past alive, enabling succeeding generations to see with their own eyes the issues and personalities of another time. It represents a national resource, a body of knowledge that can be tapped for unending instruction and even delight, a source of lessons that can be used to adapt the joys and achievements of the past to the present while avoiding past mistakes. This is just the kind of library that Nancy and I so fervently hope to see take shape at Stanford. A library that will tell about the detailed issues of our day and all the business the people who acted them out. And the issues have been great ones, as Paul so kindly said, the great as any in the second half of our century. Tax reform, the rebuilding of our defenses, the appointment of federal benches of judges determined not to make law but to interpret it. Deprive their, or derive their opinions from the Constitution itself, the reassertion of America's world role on behalf of human freedom. With so much history being made, we better take care to put the documents in good order. Sometimes it takes a little doing. Not long after leaving Sacramento, we discovered that some of the gubernatorial records have been stored in old Coors boxes. <laughs> but beyond the documents, Nancy and I are eager to see a library that conveys the drama and the feel of these years. Now in Tokyo, President Mitterrand and I found ourselves discussing the way farming had shaped the fundamental values, hard work, thrift, family, 
of both our nations. And how Mrs. Thatcher talked me of the Williamsburg Economic Summit, a summit a couple of years ago. We decided when it was our turn to host that summit to have it old Williamsburg, the historic old city of Britain's beginnings here in our country. And as usual, the first meeting of the summit is always a dinner, the first night. And uh, the seven heads of state and the head of the European community ate the people who were around the table. And I think it's all due to Margaret Thatcher that you know, we're all on a first name basis. You'd be surprised what it does for meetings of that kind when you're not speaking to someone like Mr. Prime Minister or Mr. President or something. And uh, it was Margaret across the table would say helmet. Well, anyway, I was all set for her because that dinner at Williamsburg was going to be held in the dining room of what had been the British governor's residence when they ruled these shores. And I had it all planned that after everyone was seated, I was going to open with a, a well-chosen remark. I was going to say, you know, Margaret, if one of your predecessors had been a little more clever, and that's as far as I got in what I planned to say. <laughs> Because at that point she interrupted and she said, Yes, I know, I would have been hosting this cup. <laughs> 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 and something else, tirelessly nasty at work in the campaign to save our young people from drugs. And I think from here now, we've got to move on to a real nationwide consolidated program. Because no matter how hard we try, you're never going to be able to take the drugs away from the customer completely. You can take the customer away from the drugs, and that's <coughs> what it must be. No. Well, all of this is the kind of library that we hope to see, a resource for scholars and <coughs> everyday Americans alike, a living gift to the nation. And let me say something. I'm always a little self-conscious, particularly in the presence of people like yourselves who are doing so much to help with this. I always seem to get a little self-conscious about my name, as if this is being done with it as a personal history of me. Let me explain something. Maybe some people have become president and have shown them their attitude. I don't believe you become president. The presidency is an institution in and of itself. And people like myself are given temporary custody over that institution. And that's what this history is really about, is the continuing history, not of an individual, but of that institution, the presidency, and what happened during the years. Well, we know that you share our hopes, and we want you to know that all your efforts in the part of this library, well, they mean more to us than we can say. And it's just to, I don't know how to thank you all. I'm, you know, the funny thing is, I never was very good at what so many of you were doing. And even when I was making speeches for politicians and everything, I wasn't very good at asking anybody for money. <laughs> That's why I like to pay the taxes. <laughs> but you have been doing all of this. Uh, just God bless you and reverse me. Now, I know that if you don't mind, so that we can at least have a personal word to each other and a greeting. I'm going in and stand in front of that fireplace in there with a picture of Lincoln, and I hope that you all come by and we can say hello to each other formally. All right, thank you.